Hello, this is Elisa Rodriguez, and this is Arianism Today. Hope you guys are having a great week. Today we're going to be talking about something that is a little different than what we've been doing before. Uh, what we normally do is uh, develop some kind of uh, understanding about Arianism and what we believe about Arianism through the text and all of this, but we're going to look at something new. So there's a book that was written by Eusebius of Caesarea. If you don't know who Eusebius uh, was, he was the author of the early church, uh, the church histories. He wrote the history of the church from before Jesus all the way up until his own time. He died around 345 or something, I'm just guessing, around that time. Um, and he is a very knowledgeable, respected theologian. Eusebius, when he was banished from Alexandria, went and possibly stayed in Palestine, which is modern-day Israel, uh, in the same kind of bishop uh, authority that Eusebius of Caesarea had, and he kind of stayed there and was accepted there. A lot of people, and uh, that sound is rain because it's raining over here right now. The um, Eusebius of Caesarea agreed with Arius on a lot of things, and there's a couple of things that he didn't agree with. But as far as orthodoxy is concerned, and about the way Arianism, or what's called Arianism, uh, believed is in my opinion, the better example of what Arianism believed is Eusebius of Caesarea rather than Arius. Although people want to call it Arianism because they want to use Arius, who is the controversial figure, to name this belief system and show how it's not acceptable and all this other stuff. So what we want to do is we're going to look at a book that has never been translated into English. It hasn't been translated into English um, ever since it was written. So since Eusebius died around the mid-4th century or 345 or something like that, we've had this book and we've never had it translated into English. The reason I believe that we've never had it translated into English is because Eusebius had some very controversial things to say. Things that Trinitarians wouldn't agree with. And it's important because if we want to look for, and I want Arians to hear this more than anybody else, if you want to look for an example of what Arianism believed and someone who was the epitome of what Arianism uh, believed and the viewpoint of Arianism and who had the theological explanations for everything, Eusebius of Caesarea is that person. But we've never had this book before translated into English until now. So this book, and uh, it should have shown in, in, the, uh, in the intro, uh, is called the Fathers of the uh, Church, uh, Eusebius of Caesarea against Marcellus and on Ecclesiastical Theology. And so what the story, and I'm just going to kind of narrow down what the book is about. So there was a guy named Marcellus who was trying to tell his viewpoint on the Christology and who God and the Father, uh, God the Father, the Son, and all that is. He had an unusual form of modalism, but it was modalism with like a dash of 
Sostinianism um, kind of in there where, you know, kind of mixed in. So it's kind of like a quasi Socinian modalistic view. And so he's, he's, he's kind of refuting these beliefs of this guy Marcellus, and he's trying to tell everybody else why no one should listen to him and believe what he says. And so we're going to start looking at this. And so he's talking about Marcellus's belief system. And what we're going to glean from that, I'll show you what we're going to glean from that, but it says here on in page uh, 162 of the book. And I highly encourage everyone to buy this book and read it. So it says, But if he is neither other than word, it is clear he is not son literally. Now, he's talking about in Marcellus's perspective. This is his perspective of Jesus and the word. So he's not talking about his own belief system yet. He's just explaining the other guys. So, but if he is nothing other than word, it is clear he was not son literally and truly, but as far as the term and name go, was called this in a figurative sense, saying that the word is one and the same with God. He clearly stated that the one who has who was made flesh and was born from the virgin is God himself. So this guy Marcellus is saying that the person who was born in Mary is God himself. But that the word son is not, he's not really a son. He's just, it's that modalistic oneness view where, you know, Jesus and the Father are really the same person. And he, God, came and was born through Mary, but that there's not really a sonship there. He's just the word made flesh or, or whatever. So this is Eusebius's response to this. He says about the church, he says, Long, long ago, the church of God rejected this when Sibelius said it, after counting him among the godless heretics. What's amazing about that is that Eusebius is saying, look, when you say that the Father and the Son, or that when you say that God himself was born through the Virgin Mary, he's saying from a long time ago, the church has always rejected this idea. And that Sibelius brought up this idea and they destroyed it then. And so anyone who believed that is a heretic, a godless heretic, Eusebius says. So who's a godless her heretic? Somebody who says that the person who was born through Mary is God himself. Now, isn't that amazing? That is a, an amazing statement. So what we learn from that is that Eusebius's perspective on orthodoxy, because he was the bishop, keep in mind that he's the bishop of Israel, right? That's where Jesus came from. He is uh, in the place where James was the head. He is the head uh, at that point in time. And so he's saying that the church has always believed always believed that it was not God himself who came and was born through Mary. So anybody who says that. So that applies to modalism, modalism because they say that God the Father, God himself was born through Mary. And it goes towards Trinitarianism because they say God Almighty himself was born in Mary. But Eusebius is saying that's not what the church has always believed. The church has in fact always rejected that. Okay, all right, so next page, 163, he says, The children of the Jews first received the confession of the one God in opposition to the polytheistic error of the Greeks, but the saving grace of recognizing that the same God is also the father of the one only begotten son. So he's talking about, the Jews understood that there's only one God, but he's saying, yeah, that one God gave birth to or, or gave, you know, existence to the only begotten Son. Has been given to the church as a special privilege, for as the Son, as Son, it knows Jesus Christ alone and no other, 
not according to the generation of the flesh that he assumed, for it had been taught to call this flesh the form of a slave and son of man. But according to his generation before all ages, from God himself and the Father, which is unknowable to all. And so he's saying that Jesus' generation was that that Jesus' generation, that there's a generation when Jesus was generated or created into a human form. But he's saying before that, before that, before all ages, in fact, God himself, who is the Father. So who's who's Eusebius calling God? The Father, not Jesus. He's calling the Father God. And he says that the Father uh, generated Jesus, the Son. And so that's not tr- Trinitarianism per se. Trinitarianism really tries to shy away from the generation part of it. How generation is pretty much saying generated or produced. Ju- uh, Trinitarians are afraid to say that Jesus was created or came into existence or made. But that's what it's saying. And it's saying that it's unknowable to all. Which is really important. This is where Arius and Eusebius differed at the beginning. And so Eusebius uh, tried to, and successfully, was able to explain to Arius that he had a mistake in, 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 in a viewpoint. And the other Eusebius, which is the Eusebius Necromedia, also uh, was able to convince Eusebius, uh, Arius that he didn't need to go any farther than saying that Jesus was born or created or came into existence, but not to say that he was part of the creation. That, that's a little going a little too far. And so that, that's the difference. And so that's what I, what I want to say is that in this part, I think we should depart from what Arius believed about calling him a creation and, and get a, a better perspective of, of what Jesus really is um, and being the son of God, being a God because of that, but not being the God, the almighty God, the uncreated God. And so... Um, so this is the belief system of the church is what Eusebius is teaching here. So it says, according to this generation from God, the fullness of the paternal divil- divinity also made him the son God. And so as a result, he possessed a divinity that is not his own, one separate from that of the father nor one that is without source, that is unbegotten, nor one that is foreign from somewhere else and different from the fathers. So this is where we're going to stop, but this is very important. And so Eusebius is saying that the church has always believed that the son, that the generation when God produced the son, okay, when God created the Son, when God produced the Son, when God generated the Son, all of these words are the same. Concerning this generation, he says that the fullness of the paternal divinity also made him the Son God. So he's saying that what the son, what God's divin, God's divinity is what He gave to His Son. So God's paternal divinity was given to the Son. And because that paternal divinity was given to the Son, the Son is a God. Okay? And so he's saying that because Jesus is the Son of God, an actual Son from God, therefore he is a God. And he is a God because that's because he's a descendant of the Almighty God. So you cannot just treat him like just anyone else. He's different. He's special because he was born from God. He is literally son of God in in the God divinity kind of sense. He is to be respected for those, for the properties that God the Father has given to his own son. And so it's not saying he's almighty God or the uncreated God. And that's what he says 
afterwards. So let's read it again. And we have to closely d digest this because Trinitarians just read this too fast and assume that it's talking about what they believe. And it's not. It says, So according to this generation from God, the fullness of the paternal divinity also made him the Son, God. And so as a result, he possesses, talking about Jesus, possesses a divinity that is not his own. That divinity is not his own. It's his father's divinity that's being placed on Jesus. Okay. And so one separate from that of the father. So he's saying he's get, being given a divinity, but that divinity is from the father. Yes. But it doesn't mean that him and the father are one. So he says to make sure that no one assumes this trinity. This is anti-Trinitarian statement here. He says, a divinity that's not his own, one separate from that of the Father. Not saying, and he explains further, but it's separate from the Father's divinity. So it's from the Father, but it's separate from the Father. So they're not sharing the same divinity. It is the same divinity, but he's given it in his own portion to be his own person, possessing that divinity that he got from his Father. Okay. So then he says, but this... It's separate from the Father, but it's not one that is without a source. So he's saying that, that this divinity that Jesus had got from the Father, he got it because he was given it by a source. The Father was his source. So the Father gave it to him. Jesus didn't have it always his, his own self. He didn't always exist. He was given it. So because Jesus is not the originating source of it, it's not actually his, so he's not on the same level as God, as his father. So he says, so nor, uh, nor one that is without source and that is unbegotten. So he's saying that just because Jesus is getting this divinity from the father because his father is God and so therefore he is God, a God, because of this, it doesn't mean that he's unbegotten. It also doesn't mean that he is now without source, that he's, he's always existed. So Yesubis is cutting into the belief system and he's saying, look, this is what's happening. Jesus is a divine being. He is a son of God. He is a God because his father is the God. And so because of that, you can't just ignore the fact that his father is God. Some of that divinity, that divinity is being given to Jesus, but it is separate from the Father. So now he's making sure that we know that the Father and the Son are separate persons, separate beings. And he's saying, on top of that, that doesn't mean that Jesus now is without source. But the Father's without source. No one ever created this, the Father. No one ever brought the Father into existence. Nobody ever produced or generated the Father. He's unsourced. In other words, uncreated. But Jesus is different. He is sourced. He had to get this from the Father. He had to be given life. He had to be given this divinity. He had to be given this, this divinity of the Father with him. It's separate from the Father, but he's not now, not, not because the Father is unsourced, is now Jesus also unsourced. He's saying that's not true. He is dependent on the one who gave him this life. He's been granted life. He's been granted to be the Son of God. So he's not to be considered eternal, okay? Unsourced, right? Uncreated, eternal. He's saying that's not part of Jesus. And he's saying, and that is unbegotten. He's saying, no, he's not unbegotten. He's not now not created because he came from the Father. He's saying, no, that's not true either. He is the Son he is a God because his father is the almighty God. And so therefore you cannot just say he's just a regular person. He's different from everyone. He is a God because of his father, but he is not one with the father. He is not now uncreated or eternal or unbegotten. He's none of those things. He is his own person. He's different, but we have to acknowledge this divinity that he's gotten he says, nor one that is foreign from somewhere else. So he's saying, we're not going to say also that Jesus has came from something else or came from some other source that some that, that he's also like God and he's uncreated because he's he's never had a beginning and that he's always existed and that he has this source from somewhere else that he comes from something else. No. He's saying it's not alien from the Father. It's not foreign from the Father. It's he's from the Father. And then he says from somewhere else. That is not true. 
uh, and different from the Father's. He's like, this is no different. The Father's divinity, the divinity that Jesus has, is divinity that the Father gave him. It's from the Father. It's not foreign from the Father. It's from the Father. It's not from anywhere else. Okay. Rather, he is filled with divinity by participating in the paternal divinity itself. So he's saying he's filled with it because he is he is actively within his father's divinity. No, 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 no. He's not talking about, remember, he's already stated that he's separate from the father, but he's saying just like in our case, when we are existing in our father's humanity, we have his flesh, we have our dad's flesh, we have our mom's flesh, we have that. We're living and existing and participating in this flesh that was given to us from our fathers. That's the same thing. He's saying that Jesus is uh, participating in that divinity that the Father gave him. Not that he's saying he's mixed into the Father. That's, that's a mistake. That's not what he's saying. He's saying he's participating in the divinity itself. So that just like we're participating in the flesh itself from our fathers. We're, we're living in and animated in and, and keeping for ourselves as our own bodies the flesh that the, our fathers, our parents gave us. So it says, which pours into him uh, as from a fountain. So it's something that continually comes into Jesus. Obviously, you couldn't get all of God. It's God is is so awesome. There's no end to, you know, you could never completely be filled with God. You just have to be continually fountained or, or, or showered with God's presence continually because there's no end to him. He's so awesome and he's so big. There's no end to, to that revelation and that. Uh, participation in that divinity. So, um, for the great apostle taught that in him alone dwells all the fullness of the paternal divinity. For this reason, then, one God is proclaimed by the church of God, and there is no other besides him. Okay? So you might say, well, maybe they, maybe he is trying to make a trinity thing where they're together. You're ignoring the fact that he said they're separate. He, you're ignoring the fact that he said that he's not unbegotten like the Father. He's not eternal like the Father. And But it says, for this reason, then, one God is proclaimed by the church. So the church says there's only one true God. We're talking about real God here, not Jesus. We're talking about eternal, uncreated God. There's only one. It says, the so, for this reason, one God is proclaimed by the church of God. There is no other besides him, talking about the Father, but also only one begotten Son of God. So just think about this for a second. Eusebius is saying we have one God, the church has one God, and that's somebody. But we also have Jesus. He's not saying that Jesus is the one God. He's saying that the Father is the one God of the church. He's saying then we also have someone else. Other than the one God, who else do we have? We have Jesus. So it's unequivocally say he's unequivocally saying Jesus is not the one God of the church, but he is someone important to us. He did say that he is a God because he is a descendant of the true God, but he's not the one God of the church. And so he says, <clears throat> and let me read it again. For this reason, then one God is proclaimed by the church of God. And there is no other besides him, but also only one begotten of God, son of God, I'm sorry, be only, uh, but also one only begotten son of God, the image of the paternal divinity, who because of this is God. Okay, but not a God. It's not God Almighty, but a God. So we don't see the Greek here to where we can see if it was a, uh, a uh, had a definite article ahead of it or not, but given the context and how he's saying that he's separate, he's not unsourced, he's not these things, he's the one. There's only one God, and that's the Father. And also, we have someone, the Son of God, who because of this, he says, because of this, what? Because of what? Because. He is in the image of the divine paternity, right? He's saying that because he is in the image, he's made after God's kind. 
that therefore he is a god. But he is not the true God, the one God of the church. That's not who Jesus is. The Father is the one God of the church, but who is Jesus? He is the Son of God, and therefore because he is participating in the divinity of God, he is also a God, but he's not the, untru- the, the, the true God. He is the Son of the true God. He is truly participating in the divinity that God has is part of his divinity. Jesus' divinity, but he's not the same one and the same person or the concept of the Trinity is not there because he's saying they're separate. They're separate, different. Jesus is sourced. The Father is unsourced, but he's not saying that they're the same. Realize that the Trinitarians say that they're co-equal, co-eternal, consubstantial, all of these things. Consubstantial is not true here. He's saying that they are separate. He's separate. He's a different person altogether. And unequivocally, if he's saying that only the Father is the one true God of the church, and Jesus is someone else, it shows you what the belief system is. When Eusebius is saying that if you say that God was born in Mary, right? The person born in Mary is God, in the sense of Almighty God. He's saying the church has always been against that view. So, the view that Jesus is God Almighty and God Almighty was born through Mary is a view that the church, according to Eusebius, has always been against. They've always been against that, and they started uh, coming against it with Sibelius the most. So, we're getting somewhere. I highly recommend, we're going to stop right here, but I highly recommend this book, The Fathers of the Church, Eusebius of Caesarea. It's on, it's on the, the beginning of this video. And, and we're going to get some deep, deep revelation about what the church believed. And this is the reason why this book has not been available for so long. But this is also the reason why it's existing now. Because it's for such a time as this. A time when there is people who are going to accept it and believe it and walk with it and run with it. And it is something that we've needed for so long and God has done it. It just came out January 2018. December actually 2017. Um, but we I got it in I got it the Christmas Eve, but on the website it says that it came out in January. Whatever. The issue is this book is going to help us to understand what the early church believed. Eusebius was what would be called Arian today. Eusebius of Caesarea, Eusebius of Nicomedia, but really, we need to study the belief system, the, the, the theology of Eusebius of Caesarea, and if we do that effectively enough, we will be able to re-harvest the truth of what the church believed before the Council of Nicaea and the corruptions of Athanasius. So, that was page 162 and 163 of the book and uh, we will move on to uh, later videos and, and explaining it a little further. Hope you guys have a great week. Bye.